Can I start by thanking everybody who has prepared the session for everyone this morning. We hope it will be of use to you. Um, the survey has been uh, of considerable importance and we think that the findings that we'll share with you today will be of equal importance in helping us shape the agenda for the next period in Wales. Can I uh, introduce to you um, all of our panellists this morning? Um, our presenters rather. So we've got Hayden Llewellyn, who's Chief Executive of the EWC, Liz Brimble, who's Director of Registration, Qualifications and Fitness to Practice, and Deborah Roberts, Data Collection and Reporting Manager from the EWC. I'm going to hand over to Hayden. Thanks very much, Angela, and good morning to you all. Um, I'm Hayden Llewellyn, Chief Executive of the EWC, the Education Workforce Council. As Angela mentioned, I'm joined by two colleagues this morning to give you this briefing, Liz Brimble and Debbie Roberts, so you'll hear from them later in the session. So the way in which we're going to proceed this morning, we've got around 45 minutes to brief you on the findings from the 2021 National Workforce Survey, and Liz, myself and Debbie will split the slides between us. Um, once we've done that, then we have a, a panel of people who hopefully will be well known to you to answer your questions, deal with your queries and so on. What I'm going to cover, I'm going to begin by giving you an overview of the methodology for the survey. Then I'm going to speak to you about the first couple of areas of findings. And then I'll pass across to Liz, who'll cover the next couple of areas. And then finally, um, Debbie will continue. And then I'll wrap up at the end in terms of a summary of the, the study. So in terms of the methodology for the survey, most of you will know that we have seven groups registered with the EWC, which makes up the education workforce in Wales. So notably, that's teachers and support staff in schools and further education, practitioners in work-based learning, and also youth and youth support work in that sector. But we actually had eight different questionnaires, one for each of those seven registrant groups that I referred to, plus an additional questionnaire for, there we are, thanks Lloyd, so if you look on the left-hand side there, so an additional questionnaire then for um, school leaders. That additional questionnaire was on the request of the respective trade unions in that regard. So eight different questionnaires. Um, the questionnaires were developed in full involvement and consultation of our survey partners. So I'm at pains to point out that this National Workforce Survey is not the EWC's. It was a combined um, process and effort by the EWC, the Welsh Government, the trade unions in Wales, and also employer groups, notably Colleges Wales, the National Training Federation for Wales and WLGA. The way in which we invited our registrants to respond was that we have all of their details on the Register of Education Practitioners. So we emailed or wrote to everybody on the register to say the national survey is taking place, and you're invited to respond to that. Uh, everybody who did respond were able to do that on a secure online portal. So yeah, I wanna say a little bit about the methodology in more detail because the methodology that we've used for the survey is particularly robust, as I say, because we've contacted registrants, practitioners directly and invited them to respond securely. Some of the other surveys that we've seen over the COVID period, I would say are less robust in terms of the methodology because researchers or other organizations have um, put the surveys up available on the web and really thereafter there's no real control in terms of who's filling those questionnaires out and how many times and who they purport to be so I would emphasize that we and our survey partners consider the methodology on this survey to be particularly robust. The survey period ran between January and May, um, so we invited response, but also had plenty of reminders in that period as well. And in terms of the communications plan, as I say, this was very much a joint effort. So trade unions, Welsh government, the employer organisations and ourselves were regularly promoting the survey to encourage response. The other point worth adding is that in 2016-17, the first national workforce survey took place. So this was actually the second one of its kind. In 1617, uh, work-based learning staff and youth work staff weren't registered with the EWC, so they weren't surveyed. So this year's survey 
was actually the most comprehensive survey of its type in Wales to date. Next slide, please. In terms of the, the questions we asked, they're summarized on that slide. So essentially there were six different areas that were covered by the survey. Firstly, role and career. Secondly, workload and working patterns. Thirdly, the new curriculum. Fourth, well-being. Fifth, blended and remote learning. And finally, professional learning. Some of the questions that we asked were identical to the questions in the first survey in 1617 but some of them were different, new, or moved on. So for example, in terms of curriculum, in 1617, we said, have you heard of Donaldson's report, Successful Futures? This time round, we said, do you think you're ready for the implementation of the new curriculum? Another key point in terms of this year's survey was the pandemic. So in a number of the areas and a number of the questions, we as survey partners ask things in and around the pandemic and the effects and impacts of that. And that's one of the key pieces of intelligence and information from this year's survey. So without further ado, myself, Liz and Debbie are gonna get into the detail. Um, so we'll now share the findings with you based on, on the methodology. So I'm gonna take the first two, which are the role and career, and then the issue of workload. So next slide, please. Sorry, one final one. I did jump the gun ever so slightly there just to share the response rates with you before um, I go into that detail. Uh, this is worth dwelling on and I'm gonna invite you to use the chat in a sec to give, you, give your own views on this. So you can see two columns of figures. Um, the first one there are the total numbers who responded to the survey. In total, we had over 10,000 education practitioners in Wales who responded. Then secondly, the percentages, the percentage response rates versus the practitioners who are on the EWC register. And I think what you can see there is a difference from sector to sector. Um, FE is higher than schools. Youth work and work-based learning also higher than schools. So in summary, the lowest response rate was for school staff, both teachers and support staff. We've asked our uh, survey partners for a view on why that might be. And there's been two main views coming forward as to why the school response might be lower. Um, one of them has been survey fatigue. The, the view has been that there have been another, a number of other surveys during the period of this survey, and maybe some of those was, were unhelpful in terms of the response rate. The other view we've had is that essentially school staff have uh, been put through the mill really during the COVID period both in terms of work and uh, reacting to the pandemic and maybe the last thing they wanted to do was complete another survey. But using the chat, um, feel free to put any views that you have in the chat in terms of uh, what you think about those response rates. I think I'd like to say something briefly about uh, FE as well, because the approach taken by government officials, the joint, joint trade unions and colleges Wales, I think was quite effective in getting the response rates higher in FE because there was a real collaborative approach in terms of encouraging practitioners to respond to the FE surveys. Um, one final point in terms of response rates, um, we've checked the representative of, uh, representativeness of our respondents versus the register. And pleased to say the respondents are pretty reflective of those practitioners working in Wales. The one point I would raise with you is the respondents are slightly older than the uh, profile on the register, just ever so slightly. There has been a tendency there for older registrants to, to reply. Okay, but welcome your views and your observations, as I say, in the chat on uh, the response rates there. Okay, next slide, please. So, as I say, I'm now going to go into the detail and take the first two of those areas in terms of findings. So this one specifically relates to um, one's career. So the questions we asked here were pretty similar to the ones in 2016-17. And I think an important context and backdrop here is that I think it's fair to say that we often hear in Wales, but other countries as well, particularly England, that uh, those working in education and particularly school teaching want to leave the profession and they leave in droves in the first five years and they leave in the middle of their career and so on. But generally speaking, EWC trend data, which we have a lot of now, 
has indicated that retention in Wales in the first five years, mid-career, end of the career, has generally been better than England and uh, many other countries. So what the survey information does in this area is it allows people to, to say a little bit more. Um, we're pleased to report that the majority of respondents, ranging from 60 to 75 percent, depending on the registrant group, said that their intention over the next three years is to stay and continue to develop and strengthen their practice. The most common answers thereafter were similarly positive in that respondents said they're interested in mentoring and supporting colleagues, but also aspire into higher level jobs and promotion and senior posts. On the right hand side there, you can see some of the numbers who indicated that uh, over the next three years, they were considering leaving or maybe looking towards retirement. Um, some variation from registrant group to registrant group. Uh, we've put a couple there. The highest was for school teachers in terms of considering moving on, but you'll see school leaders was, was actually half of that. The other registrant groups were, were within that range. So I think as an opener in terms of the findings from the survey, this is positive. It's consistent with um, 1617 survey and also consistent with the, the trend data that the EWC holds. Next slide, please. So I'm going to move on to, to workload now and working patterns. And there's some quite significant points in this block that I think you'd be interested in. So again, I welcome you to, to use the chat in terms of popping any questions into the panel or giving your own perspectives and observations on this area, if, if I may. So what you'll see in terms of this first question is we said, OK, for full time staff, can you indicate how many hours you work in an average week? We, we've similar data in the report for part time staff as well. And I'd really encourage you to look at the part time equivalent here, because obviously for school support staff and in FE, there are quite significant numbers of practitioners who do work on a part time basis. But the trend is broadly similar to this full time slide. So question was, as I say, on average, how many hours do, do you work in, in a normal week? So you can see quite a spread there between the different registrant groups. But I think most significantly, if you look at the top three, school teachers said, on average, 56 hours a week. School leaders, 54 a week. FE lecturers, 50 a week. <clears throat> and those numbers have increased since 2016-17. Um, so the reality is that's, that's quite a notable and, and significant point and finding from the survey consistent with the, the previous one that we did. A common thread coming out from respondents, particularly in the qualitative information, was that admin and paperwork were quite significant factors and impactors in terms of workload. Next slide, please. The survey then built in and, and around this, this point. Um, so there were further questions there. So this one said, can you tell us the extent to which you think you, you can manage your workload? And again, what you can see from the slide there between registrant groups is quite a spread from the different uh, registered groups there in education. So that was ranging from 16.5% who said they couldn't manage their workload right the way up to school teachers um, with quite a, a significant figure there of nearly 65% of, uh, sorry, 70% of school teachers and 65% of FE lecturers saying they were unable to manage their workload. Also look at those first three bars relative to, to support staff and uh, youth work and work-based learning because you can see a pretty significant differential there in terms of what respondents say. Next slide, please. There's a couple of slides there for you that uh, breaks that information down for school teachers and school leaders by phase, by sector. Um, on the left hand side, the, the graph is for school teachers, on the right hand side, for school leaders. It's worth a look, but what I will say is that the differences from phase to phase there, they're not huge, but, but there is some variation there. Um, both in terms of teachers and school leaders. So I won't say too much about that slide, but again, welcome any, any observations you might have in terms of challenges you see 
um, in the chat there, please. Next slide, thank you. Further in the, this um, topic of workload then, um, we invited respondents to say what they felt the main pressures were that impacted on their workload. Some of the responses were common to all of our registrant groups. Some of them were specific to particular registrant groups, which you'll see referenced in the brackets there. So again, administration and paperwork uh, range fairly large. Also providing additional support to learners in lots of different guises or lots of different things referred to there. I think one of the interesting ones for us are then the next two points in that ICT came out um, quite significantly, and that was in, in different guises. Some people were saying um, it was the availability of IT. Some people were saying it was the reliability of, of IT, but it did get mentioned quite a lot. And similarly, very much in the, the period of the pandemic, some respondents talked about the challenges uh, and impact of reverting to blended and remote learning because it's something they hadn't done in, in great volumes before. Um, quite a, a number of respondents mentioned class size and uh, caseload as well, if you think of, of youth work. And also, certainly from teachers, there was a reference there to time available for, for PPA. Next slide, please. So finally, on workload and working patterns, I think this is quite a useful slide. And again, welcome your own views and perspectives in the chat. But the survey asked about some practical suggestions for reducing workload. And I say, please put some of your own in the chat. Um, some of the ones there are probably not too much of a, a surprise. But again, worth sharing with you what people said and look at some of those variations between the registrant groups. So, Lots of people said re reduce contact hours or, or class size. Um, something we hear quite often is uh, look, give us a bit of time, give us a bit of space to, to do what we need to do. Um, from support staff, increasing paid working hours. Um, everybody made a reference to staffing levels. You can see admin and paperwork there again. And also that reference to technology, as I mentioned in, in the last slide. And the final uh, block on, on this slide then at the bottom, uh, if I had more time, how would I use it? Really consistent here with the 2016-17 slide on the first two bullet points. So more time for planning and preparation, more time for discussion, both with colleagues and learners. But there was a strand coming out um, in this area and uh, colleagues will go on to it when we talk about the curriculum questions about having time to prepare for the new curriculum. Okay, so those are the two, first two areas of the findings from the survey. I'll say some positive news there about how people perceive their, their careers and their future. Certainly some challenges there as in 16, 17 in terms of workload and working patterns. So Debbie, I'm gonna hand across to you now to take the next two blocks in terms of the findings, please. Thanks very much, Hayden and Borada Paub. It's really great to have this opportunity to speak with you this morning. As Hayden mentioned, I'll be covering two areas, the new curriculum and well-being. So as you're aware, schools are currently preparing for the teaching of the new curriculum for Wales, which will be implemented in 2020, uh, 2022. The survey asked whether school teachers and school leaders felt prepared with the knowledge and skills to deliver the new curriculum. As you can see from the, sl the slide, around half of school leaders agreed that they were prepared to deliver the curriculum and a slightly lower percentage of school leaders felt that they, their colleagues and their staff were prepared. This is also reflected in the response from school teachers where a third of school teachers agreed that they were prepared for the new curriculum. A slightly higher proportion, 48% of Welsh medium teachers felt confident to deliver the new curriculum through the medium of Welsh. On the next slide, you'll be able to see that we looked at the response rate by phase. Uh, Lloyd, do you mind clicking to the next slide, please? Thank you. As you can see from the breakdown on the slide, uh, the primary school teachers and special school teachers appear to feel more prepared than secondary school respondents. Two fifths in primary and over 60% in special schools of teachers stated that they agreed that they were prepared to deliver the new curriculum, compared to just under a third in the secondary, in secondary sector. 
uh, you'll see that there's actually little variation between primary and secondary school responses by leaders. They were both around 50%. However, over 60% in the middle schools and an even higher proportion in special school leaders agreed that they felt prepared for the new curriculum. On the next slide, um, you'll be able to see uh, what people said in response to the open uh, text uh, question. So if respondents indicated that they didn't feel prepared to deliver the new curriculum, they were asked what would help them feel more, more so. A large proportion actually responded to the free text response and those responses were received and analysed and a summary of those, as you can see, are on the slide. The main themes from the comments were that more guidance, training and time would be beneficial to prepare them for the new curriculum. The other things that had emerged is that COVID had had an impact, particularly on timescales. However, the main things were that professional learning and support were needed to properly implement the curriculum in a consistent way. And that's what was asked for. Professional learning will be covered by Liz in the next sets of slides, but I just wanted to mention that both school teachers and school leaders mentioned that they wanted more development in the new curriculum area. Um, as I said, that will be covered in the next section. The next section I'll be discussing is well-being. So over the next few slides, I'll be covering respondents' views on, on that subject. As you can see on the slide, the COVID uh, was mentioned by respondents as having an impact on their well-being during the past 12 months. Mainly in that respondents were concerned about their own health and those close to them. Also, many respondents reported that they were fairly anxious or very concerned regarding the impact of COVID-19 on their teaching and working practices. In addition, COVID-19 had had an impact on respondents' well-being and their safety at work. They were the main areas that were mentioned. However, other concerns were mentioned, but mainly by particular groups. For instance, well-being and workload was a concern raised in post-16 education. And also some groups raised concerns regarding balancing homeschooling and carer responsibilities, which has been similar to other surveys that have been conducted during this time in other professions and in other countries. Also, there were concerns in handling learners' anxieties um, this seemed to be more felt uh, in, the in the school sector rather than the F FE sector. It seemed that FE education, they felt slightly more prepared to handle learners' anxieties. In terms of managing well-being, because obviously during, that, uh, during the period, it, um, there were lots of pressures on individuals, respondents stated that they were aware of a range of well-being support that was offered by their employer. The main things were courses, counselling and helplines. However, a smaller proportion of respondents had actually made use of the support, uh, support that was made available to them via their employer. Of those who had actually taken advantage of the, um, the actual things that were on offer to them, uh, the most popular were training or courses. However, others had taken part in activity days um, and counselling. Despite the past, the challenges of the past 12 months, many respondents agreed that they felt secure in their jobs. And on the next slide, the other thing of note is that the graph states, uh, Lloyd, do you mind going to, thank you very much. As you can see from the graph uh, that many respondents noted that they felt supported by their employers in regard to their mental health and well-being. Uh, the breakdown, as I say, is on the slide there for you to have a look at, but it's encouraging that around 60% or over in all groups, um, people reported that they were felt supported by their employer. As I mentioned, um, that I'm going to pass over now to Elizabeth Brimble, and she'll be discussing blended and digital learning, and uh, I'll pass over to her now. So thank you very much. And please, I would encourage you, if you've got any questions, to just put it into the chat and we can respond to that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Deb, and good morning, everybody. And uh, as Deb said, I've been looking at the chat as it's been coming in, as Hayden and, uh, and Deb have been presented. So please do continue with that. So I'm going to be looking at blended and digital learning and respondents were asked to rate a number of statements in this particular area. 
Uh, before the pandemic, the level of confidence in delivering blended and digital learning was fairly mixed with uh, work-based learning practitioners feeling the most confident in working in that way pre-pandemic. Most registrant groups other than school learning support workers and youth work practitioners did refer to an increase in workload directly as a result of moving to blended and digital learning. And from the open text comments as to the factors for that increase included more emails, meetings because of less face-to-face -face contact, the fact that learners could submit work at all different times of the day, and that led to more difficulties and a more scattered approach to marking, more time spent liaising with learners and parents and carers as well, and in particular difficulties with learner engagement um, as part of that. However, a higher percentage across all of the groups agreed or strongly agreed that there were certainly benefits to continuing with blended and digital learning after the pandemic. Of note though, within that in the youth work sector itself was that nearly 80% of youth work practitioners who responded were very clear to say that blended and digital learning was not a substitute, particularly for face-to-face -face youth work. Most respondents said that they were confident that they had the technology and equipment they needed to work effectively. And on average, around 55% said that they'd had the training and support from their employers to deliver blended learning effectively. In other comments that were made around this area, there was a general feeling of optimism and that blended and digital learning was a positive contributor to education. Thanks, Lloyd. Next slide, please. So moving on from um, looking at the blended learning side of things to professional learning now, and I'm first going to look at the hours completed and the activities undertaken. So you'll see from the slide there that more school leaders completed 30 hours or more of professional learning in the last 12 months than the other categories that are listed. And respondents in that refer to collaborative learning featuring quite highly in the type of professional learning undertaken. 55% of further education teachers undertook 30 hours or more um, part-time equivalent, which is a requirement in the national contract in further education. You'll note that school learning support workers completed the least professional learning with 33% undertaking 30 hours or more or the equivalent in the last 12 months and 11% of, of school learning support staff actually said that they've not undertaken any professional learning at all within the last 12 months. The results were similar to the 1617 survey in terms of the type of professional learning that was undertaken. Attending courses or training sessions was the most common form of professional learning across the board. This was closely followed by making use of new technologies, which, uh, bearing in mind what we've discussed in the blended and digital learning uh, responses, is not surprising really uh, in terms of making use of new technologies. Thanks, Lloyd. Next slide, please. So moving on from hours completed and the types of activities to any barriers or obstacles that respondents referred to. And if you look at the table on the left there, you'll see that work-based learning practitioners and further education learning support workers, um, over 40% said that there were no barriers to uh, them obtaining professional learning and that they'd had professional learning that had met their needs in the last 12 months. But you can see there the lower groups as you go down the registrant groups. As with the uh, last survey, 2016-17 survey, the main reason or barrier for professional learning was a conflict with work or not enough time. And that was the main barrier and obstacle that came across from all of the registrant groups. Also of note was difficulties balancing home and family and personal commitments. And that was particularly shown in the post-16 sector responses. Costs related to professional learning, either personally to the individual or to the employer, were also considered a barrier in over 20% of respondents across all of the registrant groups, and more so in the school sector. And with it being the main barrier 
um, that was highlighted by school support staff in being able to access suitable professional learning. Next slide, please, Lloyd. And then finally, on professional learning, registrants were asked to respond to where they might welcome further development in, pro in professional learning. So when asked what they would uh, like to see, as with the 2016-17 survey, ICT and digital development featured very highly um, and particular reference there to the blended and digital learning side of things. All respondents said that they would welcome further development in mental health and well-being, with some focusing particularly on areas such as LGBTQ and gender identity particularly. Developing Welsh language skills further also featured across all groups, uh, and there were references to specific training based on existing fluency levels and having a clear pathway or encouragement for non-fluent speakers. And uh, given the, the 2050 target, that's really encouraging to see, I think. Specific sector requirements there were identified as well, such as industry related knowledge in the post 16 sector and leadership and management development was featured um, and referred to by a number of registrants, including work based learning, further education teachers and the youth work sector. In the school sector, school leaders referred to the need for professional training in leadership and management for those that had been in post for some time. Uh, there was a comment that uh, newly appointed or aspiring head teachers were quite supported and they had good guidance, but those that had been in post for some time were perhaps overlooked and needed um, some more development in that particular area or refresher in that particular area. As Deb indicated when she talked about curriculum, there were comments made from the school sector with regards to further development needed within um, for the new curriculum and particularly then moving on to uh, referencing additional learning needs and behaviour management as well. Behaviour management was also an area for further development, which was identified by uh, further education learning support workers in the FE sector as well. As with the other slides that we've covered so far, continue to put your, your messages in the chat and we will pick those up. But I'm going to hand back to Hayden now uh, to, to finish off with the last slides. Thanks very much to, to Liz and to Debbie. So the next slide, please. Thank you. So we're just gonna, we've got two slides to finish before we go into Q&A. And it's essentially to provide a summary for you. So the slide there has got eight or so bullets on it, which we think summarizes what respondents said in this 2021 survey. So I'm just gonna run through those for you. So firstly, uh, respondents felt that they generally wanted to continue in their chosen professions and saw progression and development as being a priority. Number two, with added guidance, there was a feeling there that there were benefits to continuing with blended or digital learning. Number three, respondents generally felt that they had support from their employers for mental health and well-being, and most felt secure in their jobs during the pandemic. I say most because there was a reference there in respect to work-based learning and youth work with some concerns. Number four, a desire across all groups to improve or further develop their Welsh language skills. Number five, um, we talked quite a bit about workload, but it was clear there that um, there are some concerns around workload in respect of contracted hours, excess administration, excessive administration and staffing levels. Number six, more support and time would be welcomed in preparing for the, the implementation of the new curriculum. Number seven, um, there was a feeling that sometimes a lack of time or conflict with work prevented um, a registrant having full access to professional development they may need or like. And finally, uh, the pandemic, not unexpected, has had an impact on a range of matters, including well-being and working practice with also some health and safety concerns. So again, as, as a theme we followed, if there's anything you wanna put in the chat or pop a question in ready for the panel on that summary, please do. Next slide, please. This is the final substantive slide then. 
And we thought it would be useful to just make one or two comparisons between the different registrant groups uh, with the EWC, because in some areas, lots of commonality, in other areas, some variation. And I, we feel that this is quite useful for you and for policymakers to have a little think about some of these differences. So firstly, managing workload would seem to be more of a, a concern for teachers and lecturers um, as compared to youth workers or workplace learning practitioners or support staff. Secondly, in FE and work-based learning, there does seem to be more of a level of confidence both pre-COVID and during COVID in terms of using blended learning or digital approaches. Number three, as mentioned in the previous slide and by my colleagues, some concerns raised in work-based learning and youth work around job security during the pandemic. Number four, in the school sector, notably with teachers and, and leaders, I'm slightly less positive there in terms of mental health and well-being support available. Number six, access and reliability of ICT would seem to be more of an issue for support staff, both in schools and FE, as opposed to, to other registrant groups. Number seven, um, and this came out very strongly in the youth sector, and we've heard this quite a lot anecdotally as well, because of the nature of youth work, um, there was a view from respondents that I hear quite often that uh, remote learning when it comes to youth work isn't a substitute for face-to-face -face contact. And finally, um, for a number of our registrant groups, cost would seem to be a barrier on occasions in terms of access to professional learning. So next slide, please. So essentially, thanks so much for, for your time in listening. That is the, the briefing we'd like to give you on the survey. The report is available on our website where you can delve into more detail. I'll shortly hand back to the chair and we'll move into Q&A. But an open offer to everybody as well. When we did the 2016-17 survey, we had quite a lot of requests from different groups to come and brief them, whether it was trade union groups or organisations or governance groups or head teachers groups to come and brief on the survey findings and we're very happy to do that so if you want individual briefings on the survey please do contact us and we're really happy to help but um, thanks very much thanks for listening and I'm going to hand back to, to EWC's chair Angela Jardine. question Hayden or blind and again, it's late for health you, my Carl Alexis, all the water ice Cymru. So do we am been through an at of all? He well does my issue to a couple of area um at our logo south point to show our dry Cymru. Just um to make people aware that we're joined today by one of our partners in the survey, um Carl Alexis, who's from Welsh Government. And I'm just going to invite him to say a few words from the perspective of Welsh Government, Diolch Carl Croeso. Okay, thanks Angela. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, all, can, all good. Okay, great. Just wanted to, so I'm Carl Alexis, I work in workforce for Welsh Government in education and obviously work closely with um, EWC. Um, just want to say a few things really. We're really pleased to be here today for this, this briefing. Um, and obviously, as Hayden said, we're, we're happy that we were able to partner with and work with EWC and the trade unions at all stages to deliver this survey. Um, so obviously, the, the Minister is committed to obtaining feedback and has previously expressed his gratitude to EWC for delivering this survey. So I think it's really important to re-emphasise that point here today. Um, the, the Minister has been and continues to be um, engaged with the workforce. And I know he's undertaken a wide range of events to talk to as diverse a range of practitioners as possible. Um, feedback from the profession is absolutely critical. Um, the results of this survey will provide further feedback. Um, and, you know, as has been mentioned, there's clear messages in relation to workload, well-being, and curriculum preparedness, um, just as a few examples there. Um, it's clear that there are some real challenges here, with some of which are, are long-standing. 
Um, and then we need to continue to work collectively on, on these if we're going to make um, the difference that we wish to. Um, as Welsh Government, we'll obviously consider carefully re the results of the survey. Um, and it's important that we reflect on the messages that are coming out, but more importantly, how we respond. Um, the survey will contribute to our approach to policy development, which we will continue taking forward with a range of partners and groups and through which we'll be making progress. Um, so just want to say again, thanks to EWC um, and also thanks to all the practitioners who have shared their thoughts with us um, through participating in this survey. Thanks very much for that, Carl. Um, some of your response there was, was timely because we, you'll have noticed in the chat there were some questions directly to Welsh Government about, you know, it's great having a survey, but what actions will follow as, as a result. So it's good to hear that uh, the Minister is on it from your perspective. And I'm sure that uh, people who are in attendance today will look forward to hearing more about the, the next steps that the Welsh Government wishes to take. So thanks for being with us this morning. Um, now I'm going to introduce our panel members to you this morning. I'm really grateful that, to them for being here and uh, they provide a cross section of education world. Can I start by introducing Dr. Rachel Bowen, who's Director of Policy and Public Affairs at Collega Cymru, um, Sharon Davis, who's Head of Education at WLGA, Neil Butler, National Official for NES UWT, and Keith Towler, Chair of the Interim Youth Work Board. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for your time and joining us today. We've had questions rolling in, as you can see. So um, without further ado, I'm going to start off just with a general question on the back of what um, Hayden was presented. There's two direct questions. Um, and one is about what did leaders say about being supported by their employer? The slide only included teachers, work-based practitioners and support workers. So if you could have a think about that one, Hayden. And then um, just in general, I think um, I'll start with Neil and Rachel on this one. Given the concerns raised about the implementation of the new curriculum, um, do you think that Welsh Government should be providing additional resources or considering a further delay. Okay, so I'll come to Neil first, I think, on that one. Thank you, Angela, and uh, thank you for that uh, for that question. Uh, we're actually we're very grateful for the EWC in terms of asking that question in the survey because it reinforces what we already knew, but it is really nice to have that statistical evidence uh, and something that we've been calling for since before COVID, which is that we need a delay in the implementation of the new curriculum. Um, the, 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 it's too important to fail, uh, and the problem that we have is that it is a in a, a, a sense a revolution in in pedagogy in schools and it needs to be prepared for it needs to be created because one of the essences of the new curriculum uh, is in a sense it's an empty vessel uh, that needs to be filled and the people who are going to have to do that filling are the school teachers uh, and at the moment and this survey I think kind of explains that and uh, uh, illustrates it really well they haven't got the time uh, quite frankly, uh, priorities have been elsewhere. So during the time that was actually set aside for the development and the building of the new curriculum, uh, priorities have been elsewhere and still are. Uh, so basically what we would like to see is a delay in the implementation of the new curriculum so that uh, teachers can build it, uh, which is which is one of the essences of the new curriculum, as I said. One last thing I'll say is uh, one thing I've learned today, and thank you for that, because it was a question I've been meaning to ask the EWC since this survey was released, was that division between primary and secondary. This reflects what we know from our membership as well. There's a there's a uh, there's quite a divide in terms of primary and secondary in terms of preparedness. Uh, and what the, the statistics you gave show that there's a there's a bigger problem in the secondary sector here, uh, which which is reflected uh, in our members uh, as well. Uh, so uh, overall, then we think there should be a delay so that this uh, the new curriculum is successful. Thanks. Uh, I'll pass over to Rachel for an FE perspective. 
I think one of the important things we need to remember here is that while the new curriculum won't feed through into post-16 um, until later in the 2020s, we need to be getting prepared for that now. The last thing we want to see, given the results of the, um, the survey, is that people are expected to prepare for learners who've gone through a completely different system of learning through their primary and secondary education, um, hitting FE when teachers and other support staff haven't haven't had a chance to kind of get to grips with what you know how those new learners will have learned. So while five years, six years can seem like a long time, it'll be on us before we know it. So we need to be doing a lot of preparation now, thinking about how to prepare post 16 institutions for those new types of learners. And we've been raising these issues with Welsh Government and we're having discussions. But yeah, there are certainly lots of things to think about because if a new curriculum is going to work, we need to make sure that people don't complete, don't experience a completely different system that has hasn't changed in the post 16 sector. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I think I'll go back to Hayden now to if he's uh, able to come back on that question about the leadership there. Thank you. Yeah, I can, Angela. Thank you. Um, so just to confirm the question that was asked in terms of support from employers, it was specifically in respect of mental health and well-being. And the question was, in essence, pre-COVID. So I just clarify that. A little bit of indifference and variation, really, in the response from school leaders. So 40% of school leaders, more or less, said that uh, they, they felt they had that support. They felt strongly or very strongly in that regard. 25% disagreed. They felt they didn't have that support available. And then 31% neither agreed or disagreed. So as I say, a little bit of indifference there in terms of the response. Thanks. Um, there's one here that came in earlier, uh, and I'm going to ask this to Keith because it centres around the Youth Work Board. So the Interim Youth Work Board for Wales has recently published its Time to Deliver report on achieving a sustainable delivery model for youth work services in Wales. How do the issues highlighted within the Works for Survey, Keith, play into the recommendations that you've made within that report? Thanks, Angela. Um, yeah, it's really timely for, from our point of view, as you rightly say, that the report has been published. One of the recommendations, I think it's recommendation 13, uh, is a recommendation for Welsh Government to build on its commitment to develop and support the youth work prof profession. Um, we know, having spoken to ministers and officials in the um, youth work branch, that they're going to use uh, the survey results from the EWC as part of a wider evidence base in thinking through how the minister is going to respond to our uh, recommendations. That that's really welcome, and uh, the minister has given an ind indication that he will respond to all of the recommendations in the interim youth work uh, board report um, by the end of the calendar year, which is really quite speedy. So that's. That's fabulous. And for us, it's all about uh, maintaining the momentum that we've got going with young people and the whole of the youth work sector in developing a vibrant youth work offer for all 11 to 25 year olds. Thanks for that. It's uh, it's good that it has dovetailed somewhat. So uh, it's been uh, good to hear that the survey has been useful uh, and aligns with uh, that interim youth work uh, Board report as well. The next question, <clears throat> I'm going to come to Sharon first of all, but very um, welcome from the rest of you any comments that you've got on this one. So the survey showed that 43.5% of school learning support workers had completed less than 30 hours of professional learning over the previous 12 months. Um, uh, what can be done to help ensure that learning support workers are able to access the professional learning opportunities that they need in order to develop their careers and fulfil their potential? And in relation to this, there is a, another question, which, um, you know, the barriers, uh, improving the barriers could possibly include funding for supply for support staff as well. So, um, can you respond to that, Sharon, first of all, and then I'll look to see if anybody else wants to jump in. Thank you. Good morning, Gorida, and thank you for the question. Um, we have been looking at, at 
There is a partnership, a social partnership group through the School of Social Partnership Forum that includes Welsh Government, um, trade unions, em employer uh, representations um, that has um, tasked a subgroup, if you like, a task of Finnish group is purely voluntary. It's not commissioned by Welsh Government or anybody else for that matter um, to, to undertake a piece of work uh, regarding support staff and um, uh, in general, the, the four areas we worked we as, as a group, and the group was made up from um, teaching assistants from schools across Wales, senior leadership uh, members from across Wales, from both primary, secondary, and special schools. You've got trade union representative there. You've got the employer representative there. Welsh government representation on that group as well. So it's quite a wide ranging um, group in that respect. And as I said, it's purely voluntary. Um, we pulled a, from that group, there's a discussion paper that's, we're currently uh, going through. Um, it's been, uh, it went back to the group on the School Social Partnership Forum. And the main four aspects within that discussion paper, as I said, this was mainly to do with support staff and teaching assistants in particular. Oh, and I, I should say as well, there's representation from EWC in the group as well, my apologies. Um, the, the four main areas are pay, deployment, access to training and professional learning and standardization of roles. So as you can see, it's quite a wide ranging uh, discussion paper. There are some recommendations from that paper that has gone back to the School Social Partnership. And we are working, um, I suppose now, we are working as a group after we're meeting this afternoon to keep the momentum going on these recommendations. Welsh Government have and are working uh, training and learning. So this is my question. How best to address that? Should see some traction in that very, very soon. I know there's a questionnaire again coming out and they are looking how best to deliver on that recommendation, on those recommendations within access to training. That, that's the easiest one, if you like, out of all the, 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 the four um, areas. The others are, are far more complex. Nevertheless, we are working, especially with Welsh Government colleagues, on how best to take these forward and to keep the momentum, understanding that there are, they are far more complex and that they may take far longer to address than uh, the access to training. So we should see some uh, real traction in that over the next few months. Hopefully that's addressed the, the, the crux of the question. Certainly does, thank you very much. I can't see anybody else eager to jump in. Oh, Hayden, over to you. Thanks, Angela. Lots of people in the, the virtual room will know that uh, school learning support staff are the biggest group in the education workforce in Wales, bigger than school teachers currently. Uh, around about 38,000, and of which about 8,500 do their work via supply as well. Um, and we've, we've had regular feedback, though I think things are improving about some of the challenges sometimes for support staff in accessing CBD and professional learning. Sometimes they've not been invited to sessions, sometimes because of the term time working, things are difficult and so on. Um, we've seen some moves and consortia are aware, and I know Welsh Government through Kevin Palmer have been looking at these things, but I still think there is, is work to do for this important uh, group within the education workforce. Thanks, Hayden. There's an attendant uh, question there, which you might want to come back to. Is so what can EWC do to leverage improvements um, rather than to, to see the um, comparative decline in the stats compared with 2016 and this, this survey? So um, what do you think the, the EWC can do to leverage an improvement in what the, um, the issues are, I suppose, is the question. Thanks. I think I'm sure. that, I was just because I will open it out to others as well. So it's always good. We, we, we know what we think we may be able to do, but it'd be good to hear the voices of others. Thanks, Angela. I alluded to this at the start, and Carl helpfully made comment as well from Welsh Government that the survey um, was and is very much a, a partnership survey. It pains to point out it's not the EWC survey, 
was a national workforce survey undertaken with Welsh Government, DWC, the trade unions and also employer groups. So I'm very keen to, to keep repeating that. So in terms of solutions then, there are lots of parties where solutions might lie. I think in respect of EWC, we've always traded on the basis as a workforce council and professional body that we're keen to use information that we have and access to our registrants to put information and evidence out in the public domain. So while we can't ourselves fix things, we can act as an enabler and a pointer out there in, in effect to raise issues and invite those who do have the policy sway to, to look at them, consider them, and seek to do something about them. So um, EWC's role really is in terms of an evidence-based organization pointing stuff out fairly and encouraging and wanting to work with others to engage in those points. I think others, Neil in particular, will probably want to add. Thanks. Rachel's indicating, so I'm going to go to you first, Rachel. Thank you. Just to say that there is work going on in the further education sector to follow up the EWC survey. There's been quite a big project around workload, taking a social partnership approach, so bringing together representatives from trades unions, representatives from colleges, Collega Cymru, to look at what we can do. I think one of the important things to bear in mind here is that the EWC survey gives us a national picture and actually the issues may be different in different parts of Wales and in different colleges. So one of the things that's going on is that, you know, local unions are working with, with their individual colleges to look at and unpick some of the findings of the survey to see, okay, you know, what's going on at a more local level? What are the actual on the ground problems? Because they may well be different in a college like Pembrokeshire to perhaps a college like Group Clandestal Menai in the North. So there is, you know, this work is ongoing. We are taking the survey seriously and the social partnership approach is really important to the further education sector. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I think Keith is indicating next, and then I'll come to Neil afterwards. Thanks, Angela. Just, just to say that in relation to the youth work strategy, we've got a, a, a variety of, of, we call them strategic participation groups or, or workforce or, or, or groups looking at uh, implementation of the strategy. One of them is around the workforce development group. Um, and um, one of the things that we will be really interested to do is to pick up uh, the points that, that are flowing from this survey, but also to think about youth support workers because they're quite uh, low in terms of their percentage return to this survey, which raises, I think, some questions for us about not just qualified youth workers, but also uh, our youth support workforce, which, which, which has a, a lot of, as you were talking about, um, school support there's a lot of resonance around what youth support workers might say i think and a bit of work for us to do in terms of reaching them but uh, really valuable uh, that this survey is around and the workforce development group will certainly pick up the key themes that are emerging for us thanks keith over to you neil Thanks, Angela. Well, obviously, I can't speak for the um, the EWC, but as far as the NASUWT is concerned, part of our remit as a trade union is to campaign for uh, uh, improvements in education uh, to benefit uh, our members. Um, and we've done a number of campaigns, not least actually, the in terms of trying to get the uh, the new curriculum delayed. But I'm going to give a plug um, to uh, the in terms of the um, uh, managing workload and reducing bureaucracy workload group, which meets with the Welsh government and employers is kind of a tripartite group which is actually uh, really actually now I think beginning to uh, come up with some good ideas which I hope will be uh, um, uh, fed into the education service in Wales and make some significant changes in terms of workload because obviously that's a key concern for us which is reflected in the survey but I will say one thing I will uh, you know say one thing which might uh, be a little bit more controversial uh, which is that one of our problems that we've always seen and I think it's reflected a little bit in the question is that whenever we go to anyone whether it be a school a local authority the welsh government uh we tend to get um uh, the response well you know we nothing to do with us really uh, you need to go and see them uh you know if it's the welsh government or nothing to do with us you need to see the local authorities the local authorities nothing to do with us go and talk to the school it's the governing body's responsibility and you get passed from pillar to post as to whose responsibility it is who uh, who is you know who holds the power in all of this and that i think has been um uh, blurred uh, by uh, local management of schools and, uh, and, and certainly a campaign that the NASUWT is going to be launching soon 
is to look to kind of have some clarity in this, bring back control to local authority control so we can get some clarity in terms of who's responsible, who do you talk to, who do you get change from? Uh, and we're going to be launching that campaign soon. And I think that's really significant, by the way, because we do a lot of talking about this. We'll be coming together in another couple of years and bemoaning the, 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 the statistics. What are we going to do about it? Well, let's get something done about it. Let's have a clear responsibility uh, uh, and accountability with regards to this and, uh, and get something done. Thanks, Neil. I think um, from this morning's and the, the, the comments in the box as well, there is an appetite for actual uh, a move to some action. And it's it's nice to hear that there are groups in train already to be able to look at this. But I think hopefully what the survey will do will be to add impetus to that work, as you say. So um, uh, hopefully today will be another lens that will add some focus to this the need for this work. I've got another question here, which relates to the higher retention of teachers and education workers in Wales relative to other systems and countries. The um, person who's posed the question says that's really interesting, but why is it? Is this something good, like better onboarding and support, or is it something less good, like fewer alternatives in the local economy and the wider learning or education sector that's to blame? So. Um, or, or, or to thank, depending on how you look at it, isn't it? So uh, just open that up in general. Is there anybody in specific that would like to take a, a first step on that one? Uh, Neil. Thank you. I, well, actually, I think that's a really good question. Uh, and uh, it'd be interesting to try and get to the bottom of that question, uh, because uh, I always felt it was the latter, actually. It's because basically, and certainly where I live in mid Wales, um, you couldn't get a, a job uh, that paid close to what I was earning uh, as a teacher at that time. But I tell you what, we have got a bit of a problem. I had a leaflet drop through my door uh, the other day from a local delivery company uh, offering a staggering uh, wage for driving a van, uh, a, a better wage than you'd get uh, on the top of the main scale for a teacher. So I think we better be careful about this because actually I think uh, wages are increasing elsewhere as demand increase elsewhere for different sectors in jobs, which uh, certainly because I enjoy driving, I would consider to be a good deal less stressful uh, than, uh, and, and I think it's in, again reflected in your, in your survey. So watch this space on that one. I think it's an element of supply and demand. Thank you. Anybody else want to come in on that one? Hayden? Yeah, at EWC, we've followed the, the trends and the stats in different professions and countries on this for a long time. And um, in terms of recruitment and retention to education, but notably school teaching in Wales, for lots of years, you know, we were in good nick in Wales. We didn't really have the recruitment and retention issues that we saw in, in teaching in other countries and other professions, but we caught some of that flu disease, whatever you want to call it, a few years ago, where we started seeing our numbers tightening up as well, particularly around recruitment. And I think it's fairly well reported that uh, we saw um, trainee numbers for teacher training going down, 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 down. Now we've started going up again, which is good news. But certainly in terms of teacher recruitment and retention, it's been a bit of a global issue for quite a few years. And we in Wales caught it in a way we'd never caught it before. Um, Pleased to say that there's a number of initiatives in Wales through Welsh Government and others now to make things better, and we've seen increases in numbers. Um, so that's good news. But as Neil said, I think it's really important that you're not complacent because uh, there are very much supply and demand issues in, back across other professions and so on. When you've got a pandemic, obviously teaching is seen as more of a secure career. It might be the same whether it's youth work, FE, whatever it might be. But as Neil said, things change and it's supply and demand. So don't be complacent. Thank you. Um, over to you, Keith. Yeah, I think thanks, Angela. I think I think what Hayden said there is is probably um, covered some of the things I was going to say. But from a youth work perspective, youth work's got a really interesting culture of kind of growing its own in a sense. So young people who who access a, a youth work opportunity very often go into youth work volunteering, and 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 a fair percentage of them will be interested in developing a career or getting a job uh, as as a youth worker. But what we've seen, of course, particularly in 
voluntary youth work sector is, um, and this happened before the pandemic, is austerity really saw um, the voluntary youth work sector struggle. So we've seen lots of kind of closures of youth work services um, and we've seen youth workers popping up in other sectors. And, and just to say that I did, um, uh, I used to be the Children's Commissioner for Wales, so I, and I still do some work in terms of uh, UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I spoke to an audience of youth work, uh, it was a mixed audience of youth work, um, teaching and uh, social work students to talk to them about uh, youth work ostensibly and the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. As I was doing that, I got some questions from youth work students at the end of the session asking me if they were doing the right course because actually what what they what they saw was more stability in social work more stability in teaching and I, and I think it's hard to argue that when the legislative basis for youth work is as poor as it is and you won't be surprised to know that we've made a recommendation about that in in our report and hope that ministers pick pick that up but there's something about the perception of youth work as a career in comparison to others in the public sector that we need to do a bit of a bit of work on. Thank you for those uh, contributions. Very uh, interesting and, and timely question, as you say, and one to keep an eye on most definitely. Um, and hopefully that's something that we can add to the mix. Um, I've got a, a general one here, which uh, I'll just open to the floor. There are a lot of changes we've heard currently taking place that are impacting on the education workforce in all its guises, not least the introduction of the new curriculum, which we've already touched on. Um, what do you think the role of a national survey could be? Do you think it, it would be worth conducting another survey, perhaps in a couple of years, in order to understand the impact of these changes on the workforce and to monitor progress? Um, some views on that. Thank you. Tumbleweed moment. <laughs> Rachel, thank you. I think it probably is worth repeating the survey um, in a few years time. I think it's important to remember that while the results were kind of broadly in line with the previous survey, when this was conducted between January and May this year, that was when we had the suspension of face-to-face -face teaching for probably one of its longest times when people were under you know, immense pressure. The, and the questions around kind of digital resources, there was obviously a lot of work going on around digitalization in further education colleges, in workplace learning and in schools prior to the pandemic. But the pandemic turned what had been a developing work stream into you know, a necessity overnight. So it would be interesting to see in a few years time the impact of how that's worked through and whether people are more confident, whether people have had a chance to have the training that they, you know, so in some cases we've seen that people would like. So I think, yeah, repeating the survey, but focusing maybe on some of those aspects and how that might have changed over you know, the course of the next two to three years might be useful. Thank you. Uh, go to Sharon. I would agree. I think it's it's a timely temperature check under the context during that time, isn't it? We, we you know we're still in a pandemic. When this was taken back in the summer, absolutely, we had new ways of uh, teaching and learning, the whole blended learning, the digital learning. And I think absolutely, in a few years' time, we could be in a different context as, again. Bear in mind, I don't think COVID is good. You know, we've got to live with COVID, but it'll be different again in a few years' time. And I think it's it's quite important that we listen to the profession on the ground. They're the ones dealing every day with it, whether they're a senior leader, a support staff, everybody's dealing with it within their own profession. And I think it's quite timely then to have a temperature check. And it's also for us to listen and then able to um, react appropriately and to avoid being reactive and try and plan ahead appropriately as well. Thank you. Well, Sharon, um, over to Keith. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Sharon. I, I, I think it would be useful to, to do a follow up. I, I was thinking, you know, when Hayden was doing his bit earlier and we referred to the youth work response around. Um, how youth workers and youth support workers have had to think about digital ways of working and reaching out to young people and saying very clearly, look, you know, that's not a substitute for face to face work. And I think everybody would 
agree with that. But there's been a really interesting dynamic around safeguarding, you know, and thinking about um, how certainly how youth support workers and, and, and youth workers have adapted and changed to a kind of a hybrid model, which enables them to continue to work with some of the most uh, vulnerable young people that we have. And, and, and I think, a, you know, a bit of a follow up survey about some of those new ways of working and people's attitude to that. Uh, whether they they feel they're being appropriately trained and supported in in some of the ways in which they're working would be really really valuable. And as Sharon said, using that information to inform and tailor how we might provide support for people and training for people and confidence actually in continuing if they have to continue working in this kind of rather hybrid way, then I, I'd be all for that because that that's all about learning and that that would be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Neil? Uh, well, the, the surveys are extremely useful, especially if they're, they're robust and accurate ones for the reasons I think that Hayden gave earlier and, and this one is, and hopefully this will go from strength to strength. Large number of stakeholders involved with this, but I think what we need to do is, uh, you know, come together and, uh, and and be a bit more forceful about this and have this on a on a more regular basis, because of course it, 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 it uh, you know, it's great, great for us because it will support uh, campaigns and issues that we're raising and also challenge us, by the way. Sometimes we make assumptions uh, about what's going on, which are which are challenged by these. The only thing I'd say is this um, uh, on it, though, is that uh, this survey was January to May uh, of this year. It kind of ended just before the workload tsunami of the centre designated grades. And it's interesting to see, uh, you know, 70.4 percent of teachers saying basically they didn't have not enough hours in the day. I'd love to have seen uh, if we could have had a survey a couple of months later uh, after the CDGs hit secondary schools, because I think that would have had uh, a, a more startling effect. But that, and that reflects to a certain extent the problems of, you know, surveys in terms of they, they hit you at a particular time when you might be hit by a particular issue uh, as in you know covid being the obvious one so yeah i think it's i think this is great i think we should repeat it on a regular basis and i think you know making a commitment from our side i think we'll put a bit more oomph behind it because we can all collectively use this to kind of get that uh, essential snapshot of the education service in wales thanks neil um hayden before i come to you for your perspectives there's a couple of things in the chat bar there so um there is value in repeating it um and that the survey probably should be conducted again but needs to be given to increasing consideration needs to be given to increasing participation possibly encouraging uh, schools to set time aside for the workforce to complete it and obviously those points about when is the best time of year to do it as well? So if you could incorporate some of that into your response, I'd be really grateful. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Angela. First, uh, I think I'd like to say that um, trade unions, both teacher unions, school support staff unions, and FE trade unions, have been knocking on the EWC and Welsh Government's door about when another survey was going to be done. Um, following the one in 1617, I can see Neil agreeing with that because we've been asked for a while and um, I'm sure Carl will testify to this one from Welsh Government, but it was Kirsty Williams who said, yeah, I want a survey done as well. And to some trepidation to the officials, because obviously they need to deal with what comes out of a survey, but there had been momentum for quite some time. Um, hopefully Neil will come off the back of what I've said to say, look, we do need to do another survey and we need to keep them going. Um, Neil mentioned the Managing Workload and Bureaucracy Group for Schools, and in that group, I and others have said, look, Obviously, one of the problems is creating extra work for heads and teachers and support staff and everybody else. When it comes to surveys, let's have a national one endorsed by all the partners and stop the other ones happening that duplicate and cause more work for the practitioners. Because unfortunately, there were a load of other surveys during the COVID period that caused more work. And that's what we're saying in the Managing Workload Bureaucracy Group. Look, do something centrally so everybody knows this is the big one. This is the one you fill in. And it creates less work for everybody. So I and others do think that. Um, I want to go back a little bit to the FE side as well. Rachel might want to add, because I do think um, the model there where the trade unions, Welsh Government and uh, Clegg Camry got together to push the survey, agree the questions, and now we're looking at actions and responses is a really good model. It's a great model. I'm seeing some really good work on the FE side. 
Yeah, thanks, Hayden. Did you want to respond, Rachel? Yeah, just to say that, um, you know, it is good that when you have a survey, the risk is often everybody does a bit of hand wringing and nothing really changes on the back of it. And I know that the work here is ongoing, but there are discussions going on between local unions and their colleges that will then come back at a national group level to look at, okay, but what do we do? How do we solve some of these problems? Knowing that something's a problem doesn't actually change it. We need to think about, okay, but how do we address that? And as I said earlier, you know, the challenges are likely to be different for different colleges, but there are probably things that people can learn across the board. So yeah, we're really pleased to be working with trades unions, with Welsh government to think about, you know, how do we actually address some of these issues? Thank you. And there are possibilities in the future of, you know, it, the importance of the national picture can't be underestimated. And we would all say that it adds a new dimension. But the, the possibilities and the beauty of the data, data that uh, comes back from these is that we're able to sort of cut them in different ways as well uh, to provide specific information to specific groups. So there is a, a benefit of it. And just to make that point that you know, doing a survey is all great and well, but we do expect there to be some series of actions coming out of it. And that's where the FE um, partnerships there have taken a lead, really, and we can all learn from that. Thank you ever so much. Um, I've just noted there the National Academy for Educational Leadership would welcome being involved in the next survey. And um, we're definitely, you know, the points that Hayden made about not duplicating work for um the sector to be able to get the best picture across. Partnership has been great in terms of working on this survey, and I know that we'll be looking to continue that partnership approach in the future. So thank you, everybody. Um, I'm not going to take any more questions just at that point, and I think it's been a very full session this morning. I'd just like to thank all of the contributors for their um, input this morning and for being part of today's presentation. Um, I think it's quite clear that the survey is a value and is something that the messages that come out of it can be used to develop the professions and the lot of the professions. Hearing the voice of the individual educators is really key to making sure that the policy on a national basis is as good as it can be um, and we do need to be listening to those responses. I think it's really important that the EWC continues to uh, be able to amplify the voices of all those in the seven registrant groups and hopefully what we've done today will be some part of uh, contributing to that. Before I close the event. I just want to take an opportunity to remind you of a, a few things that the EWC is putting on. Um, so some upcoming events which will be of interest to a lot of you in the sector. So we have on the 25th of November between 9.30 and 12.30, we have moving from non-racist to anti-racist practice in partnership with um, BAME Ed Network Wales. Um, and um, we're going to have a further event on sharing the research on learning that's been done during the pandemic, which will be at the beginning of December. And in the new year, we've got some further um, events, including our annual lecture, professionally speaking, with uh, Yong Zhao at the end of January. So look out for those in your inboxes. And I think there's been some uh, directions to those put in the chat box by Lloyd for everybody to be able to see. Um, and also just to point out to you, the recent launch of something we're calling Medal Maur, which is a new book and journal club where we'll share our recommendations on a monthly basis of ebooks and journals that you have free access to as a registrant on EBSCO. So thanks everybody for being with us today. Hopefully that will have whetted your appetite to take a further and closer look at the outcomes of the survey. Thank you to all participants. Thank you to the excellent team at the EWC who've made this morning possible. And thank you to the data team in particular for doing all of the work on bringing the survey together. Finally, thank you to all of the participants who actually took the time to fill in the survey and to encourage people in the future to do that should the opportunity arise. And safe journey for the rest of the day. Thank you.